Hi, I am Loz and I welcome you to a brand new series, A Bad Case of Yesteria. It's a neologism, I just made it up. This is a show for those who, just like me, have a fascination for the past, especially when it comes to technology. Today I am talking to you from where it all started, my old room at my parents' place. Let me give you a quick tour before we dive into today's topic. No matter what year you're in, video editing takes a lot of space. So when I found the passion for it in my uni years, uh, yeah, that haircut was embarrassing, just, just pretend you never saw that, I decided to get rid of my little old desk and my bed in order to upgrade to a loft bed, under which I could build a desk and have all the room for my multi-monitor setup. In the late 90s, non-linear editing was a new thing, and the only way to learn it was hands-on. I was incredibly lucky to be mentored by my friend Luca Fantini, who has become an amazing director of photography and today works in the USA. Back in the day, he worked for a big media production company, and I was fascinated by the Avid setup they had, in particular by their multi-level desk. I asked my friend how much it cost, and it would be in the tens of thousands of dollars today. So I thought, no way, I can build my own, just like it. So I designed and built this one with the help of my dad. I had two PCs, both in rack cases, and they used to slot in here. This is fake and faded, a replica of the Avid hardware of the time. These switches powered different sections of the desk. And before I moved overseas and sold all my gear, I had a DV tape unit here, a DVD player, VCRs and so on here. On top of the main level, I had a dual monitor setup and TV. On these shelves, I used to have hundreds of CDs. Music always helped me to find inspiration for my video editing, which soon enough became a job and kept me occupied for years. Here is where I worked for quite some time and spent many sleepless nights. I hope you enjoyed this little insight into my background. And now, back to the episode. I diagnosed myself with the hysteria, a made up word because there was simply no name for my condition. So what are the symptoms? Well, some people say that I'm a hoarder of all stuff. Others that I am just straight up crazy. <laughs> the truth, as we know, lies somewhere in the middle. Mine is probably an obsession, but with good reason an attraction for a time when technology looked complicated but was way simpler. An example? Who does actually know how to use all the different gestures to control your iPhone or MacBook? Pinch, tap, swipe, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers, ten fingers, one finger… it's madness! Here is what used to happen a few decades ago. Want to turn your computer on? Done. Need to connect external devices? Just plug them in, no drivers needed. Want to load the video game Batman? No problem, just type load. Bam! Want to shut it down? Voila! So, call me insane if I feel nostalgic about the past. A time when things just worked. When you purchased a physical game. When you owned and collected physical products. They came with carefully prepared manuals and it was an enjoyable experience to read them. Let's have a look at my very first video game for PC, Robin Hood. We have some cool artwork on the front, plus screenshots and a description of the game in multiple languages at the back. Inside, a thick manual with lots of information. A card with hints. A pretty cool quick start guide. A registration card with the chance of winning the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves 1991 movie. And obviously the game itself. Believe it or not, these floppies still work today. Can you say the same about DVD-ROMs that you burned just 10 years ago? I certainly cannot! Now for comparison, let's see what we have today. Lots of discs, which are useless. The installer on disc 1 will automatically download the game from the internet anyway. The serial code, advertising to make me buy something else and th th that's it! Not even a quick start guide, nothing! Best of all, old games just worked right out of the box. Unbelievable, right? But why should it be any different? This is why in this episode I would like to spend a few words on nowadays internet-dependent cloud-based software. 
Call me mad, but I preferred when software houses had to truly, thoroughly test their stuff before getting it imprinted on a cassette floppy or disk. Because before the internet, once on the shelf, a product could not be changed. It had to work. Any significant bug meant the difference from a potential success to a total commercial disaster. Today, it's like everything is forgiven. Today, you cannot run anything without patches. It's unthinkable to be able to finish a game without an update. Professionals are no better off. Cloud-based applications are often rushed to the market. They are plagued by bugs and glitches, so that we, the consumers, have to do the developer's job. Find what doesn't work and report it. For free! And naturally, our workflow is broken, we cannot deliver what we are trying to create, we lose precious time and money, and get frustrated waiting forever for an update that will most likely fix one thing and introduce newer bugs. Does that sound right to you? And don't get me started on the subscription-only business model, <laughs> oh boy! The fact that you have to pay a recurring monthly or yearly fee means software houses don't have to work hard for their money. You see, whether they introduce new features or not, you still have to pay. You have to pay for what is just the privilege to use their software. Before the advent of this cloud crap, or CC for short, a new release had to have some major revolutionary new features to convince you to spend your hard-earned money on it. Today, software houses that adopted this business model don't have to do that anymore. There is no incentive for them to follow up issues promptly, to fix bugs, to provide you with groundbreaking new tools. They get their money anyway and they can increase the cost of the subscription at any moment. If you want to keep working on an ongoing project, you have got to pay. It's the death of innovation. Software houses only minor nuisance is keeping up with the competition only if and when there's any. But when they control the market, customers don't really have a choice. Plus, when anything good threatens their monopoly, they can just throw some millions at the competition, acquire, mothball, and shelf that product. Simple as that. I love old stuff. Provided that you still have working hardware, which is usually the case, as once upon a time, things were built to last, you can play a 20-30 year old game, no problem. Try to do the same in the future with what you purchase today. What did I actually buy? The privilege to use a program for an amount of time that someone else decides? Now, I do not expect the program to be perpetually supported. I'm aware that sooner or later it will no longer work on a new computer or operating system. I am fine with that. But I think it's my business if I want to keep old hardware around in order to run something. And let's not forget something very important. When music, movies, software or games came on physical media, we were able to trade, sell or buy them secondhand. They were not linked to an account with a company that might not exist tomorrow. Physical media. Think about it. We were promised a world of advantages, convenience, lower costs, when in fact buying a music album or movie online is often more expensive than picking up the physical copy from a store. Despite zero distribution costs, no case, no production and graphic design, no paper, no disc, no pretty menus, no extras, nothing, someone was allowed to cut jobs, give us much less, increase the price and make a huge profit. Let me tell you, we have been ripped off big time. But hey, don't mind me and what I say, I just have a bad case of Yesteria.
6-core, 12-thread CPU, and Adobe Premiere Pro cannot play smoothly a single track of 4K video with basic effects. My $1100 GPU is taking a nap while the CPU is maxed out. This computer can play 4K movies no problem. It can play games in 4K resolution, but anything inside this resource hog, nah. I started my career on Premiere. I started with version 4.0. At the time I chose it because Premiere was the underdog and now it's just a piece of dog poo. <laughs> oh, oh. What is this new shiny thing? Huh.